Welcome, everyone. My name is Nancy Deutsch. I am the director of Youth Next, the UVA Center to Promote Effective Youth Development. And I'd like to welcome you to the first of the Curry Research Lectureship Series this year. Um, very exciting. This talk also represents um, a collaboration between um, different departments and disciplines across grounds. And so this talk is actually being co-sponsored along with Youth Next by UVA's now Department of Women, Gender, and Sexuality and the UVA Engaged Youth Initiative with support from the Jefferson Trust. So we're really excited to be coming together um, across different schools and departments at the university um, to be doing work around positive youth development, youth engagement, and we're especially excited that um, Dr. Stephen Russell is with us today giving a talk called LGBTQ Youth Health and Resilience. Um, before I introduce him, a quick couple of save the dates. On Thursday, September 28th, Youth Next is hosting a special talk at an unusual time for us. Jonathan Zimmerman will be speaking at noon here in Holloway Hall. The talk is entitled, You Can't Say That, Teachers and Controversial Issues in American Schools. And then on Friday, September 29th, we have the next in the Curry Research um, Lectureship Series with Susan Moore Johnson on Rethinking Teacher Quality. And then finally, for those of you who are not yet aware, we have a conference coming up at Youth Next, Friday, uh, Thursday and Friday, October 26th and 27th. It is the theme this year. It is Youth Act, Social Justice, Civic and Political Engagement. Um, we are also, as part of that, hosting a special workshop. You do not have to be uh, registered for or attending the conference to attend the workshop. Um, the workshop will take place on Friday afternoon, October 27th, and it is entitled, What Now? A Critical Conversation About Community Healing, Black Youth Engagement, Sociopolitical Context, and Policy. Um, it is being facilitated, facilitated by the Association of Black Psychologists Student Circle, and it is open to everyone in the community um, and will provide a healing space for all, focused on the importance of an Afrocentric approach, amplifying the voice of black students, and that was added on to the conference following um, the events here in Charlottesville of August 11th and 12th. So we hope you can join us for some of those events. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Russell, who is the Priscilla Pond Flan Regents Professor in Child Development, Chair of Department of Human Development and Family Sciences at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, he is one of the foremost experts on LGBTQ youth with a focus on adolescent health and rights. Um, so when I thought about this introduction, I could give you a list of his publications and positions and things he has done. Um, you can read about those online, and he has many. Instead, I'm going to provide you with a small glimpse into, I think, what his work um, and approach to work might mean to many of us. So for anyone who has ever felt somewhat different, somewhat out of place in a context or a setting, whether it's because of an aspect of, a, of our identity or an approach to science or the way that we think about the world. You might have a moment where somebody who has a stage or a platform that you do not have said something that makes you feel like oh, other people feel this way or other people see this and it makes you feel not alone. Sometimes it's a musician, sometimes it's a teacher. For me, in 2014, it was Dr. Stephen Russell, who was the president at the time of the Society for Research on Adolescence. And in his pres presidential address, um, he challenged us to think about the role of social justice in science and research. And I want to read you just a short clip. Short, I can't read a clip. <laughs> a short excerpt um, from the essay that came out of that to give you a sense of why, um, particularly given the framing we use at Youth Next and here in general, um, I find this so meaningful. So this is from the essay that he adapted from that speech. Science has the potential to improve the human condition, but also the power and authority to pathologize and stigmatize young people. A social justice perspective insists that we acknowledge our part in perpetuating pathologized understandings of youth and in creating a status quo not only in research on adolescence, but on societal understandings of the very notions of adolescence, adolescents, and teenagers. 
Consider that our field traces its history to G. Stanley Hall, whose legacy of storm and stress influenced lasting public and scientific understandings of adolescence. 65 years later, these ideas were ingrained in psychological understandings of essence. He quotes from Freud, I'll skip the quote, get to the last sentence. My point is not that developmental challenges during adolescence are not real or legitimate, but that those ideas have contributed to a pathologized societal understanding of adolescence and adolescence, which are further complicated or magnified across race and ethnicity, social class, gender, sexuality, and other categories of inequality. And Dr. Rosso really pushed us to think about um, the ways in which our work can reify those or challenge them and be used for social justice. Um, and given our approach to thinking about youth and particularly marginalized youth um, from a positive lens and a lens of youth as assets, I've really appreciated that. So it is my genuine and great pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Russell. Thank you. Oh, I didn't do the important thing, turn on the mic. Thank you so much, that's such a nice introduction. And um, so you, you got it, like thank you. Like that, I, I, you know, that was, it was a, uh, an important moment for me as president of SRA to say something that I felt I, I wanted to hear and had been longing to hear and had not ever heard in a place like that, frankly. Um, where we do empirical science about young people. Um, so I, I really, that's really, I'm grateful. And one of the things actually having done that, um, having, having sort of put myself out there in a way which seems very trivial really in the bigger scheme of things, but having written, having sort of challenged an academic society to think about social justice and written about it, you know, which like really, it's, not, you know, it's kind of like the stakes are very low in, those, in that situation. Uh, on a, in a global way, but it, it is, has, has really, um, was an intervention in my own sort of um, practices as a scholar. Um, and so now when I get invited to do something like come to University of Virginia and give a talk, I sort of am more interested in thinking about, I'm less interested in like my, m the, the data that I'm into. I mean, I really am a data geek and I love, love, love the, the, scholar, the research I'm doing. And I've been talking with you all, several of you over the last couple of days about how excited I am about um, the specific empirical work that I'm doing. But I sort of, I, I kind of, am t I, I don't really want to stand in a situation like this, um, which is I think really an outmoded way. I mean, it is the way, it is our culture and the way that we do things, but I don't really want to stand and tell you data. I would rather sort of talk about things that, um, that I, the kind of ideas that I'm thinking about. So what I plan to do today is um, share uh, uh, some some ideas I have that's piecing data together, uh, research together uh, about kind of where where I like where my mind is right now, which is really kind of fresh out of this summer, on what I'm thinking about LGBTQ young people and their health and resilience and well-being. And I will present following that I will present some data because that's what we do. Um, and I am, I'm taking a risk on this data because I've, I've been telling people I'm not sure if what I'm going to present is like smart or dumb, but I guess the, I'll find out, you know. So I'm, I'm, all, I'm, I'm, I'm now a regents professor, so I can be dumb in public and it doesn't even look dumb. Um, people will be like, okay, maybe that wasn't dumb. But was that dumb? Yeah, so if, you, if, you're a real, um, if you're a real methods person, you can tell me afterwards, that was dumb. Um, and you can help me figure out how to make it better. Um, and the other thing that is, you know, so clear is that, um, y you know, visiting you all here now in this time um, is, feels important and it feels like sort of presenting data is trivial um, and that sort of our role as, um, as individual uh, students and learners and scientists and educators and the role of the academy is, um, uh, we're, we're all, quite, I mean, the, the gestalt here uh, that I felt since I've been here, that I will, that I, that I, and I want to tell you, it's the, it, we're feeling it everywhere, right? Is like, what are we doing? And why are we doing it? And, and how can we continue to do the way we've been doing things, the way we've been doing it? Um, and so I, I also want to honor that and acknowledge that in the space. Um, and maybe I'll come back to that a little bit um, about what I hope might be a hopeful vision for uh, you know, what we can do as uh, scholars, advocates, uh, thinkers, learners. Um, so let me try to do this talk thing 
and then then maybe we can talk. But um, so I the frame for this is that uh, it goes without saying in this room probably that LGBTQ um, issues and rights have emerged as like a major political uh, a major piece of the political discourse and the public discourse in the last. Who wants to give it a number of decades? The last two decades, three decades, maybe. Um, may, you know, there, there, there were like traces of it before, but really, this has come on as a part of our cultural dialogue in the last two decades. And um, and the scholarship has, you know, scholarship on LGBTQ uh, people and lives has emerged as well. And in the context of a, people like uh, me, I, I have documented important disparities that are, are urgent and that demand our attention. And have and those disparities and the problems have received a lot more attention than as resilience and well-being, and so um, so what I do want to do is is present. I, I'm engaged in a collection of studies that continue to try to interrogate uh, vulnerability, uh, but also I hope can contribute to understanding some like risk, uh, some protective and uh, resilience uh, ideas. So um, and that hopefully all of that might you know might be used to advocate for activate social justice. But let me, I shared a paper, some of you may have seen a paper that I, sh that I shared before I came. So I'm gonna quickly give you this. Um, I, this was in the a Journal of uh, Annual Review of Clinical Psychology, which is great to work for because then they have graphic artists that work with you. And I kid you not, I literally wrote on a napkin <laughs> with, with my colleague, we were sitting and saying, it's like, we want it to look like this. And I took a photo of it and I emailed it to the graphic artist and Got a really great, this, this is my crummy PowerPoint version of a beautiful graphic that's in that article, but um, this is sort of my like rough heuristic of what I see going on for LGBTQ young people. And, and I wanna start first with this um, strange peachy color uh, change in societal attitudes. Uh, I don't have data on here. I thought about adding data in the, in the, um, in the paper, but if you'd look at something like general social survey data, uh, if you look at anything recent, the problem, the problem is we don't really have consistent public Im attitudinal data about LGBTQ people and lives. I mean, there's a question about should homosexuals be allowed to be teachers that was asked early in the 70s, and basically the answer then was no, homosexuals shouldn't be allowed to be teachers. But by the 1990s, pretty much people thought it was okay for homosexuals to be teachers. Um, and since then, you all know, you've all heard the dramatic uh, t turn in public perception for of the acceptability of marriage for uh, same-sex couples just in the last decade. So the, the pace of social change in one generation, one, one lifetime is extraordinary. And you know, the conversation in the bar or afterwards, you know, in one academic career, be sure while you're at UVA to like get to know Charlotte Patterson and hear, her, hear about her, like where she started and like what she contributed to and just in the lifetime of one scholar uh, my own, you know, work, like, wow, the kinds of questions we ask now and the way that we were thinking about it. I juxtapose this with um, the average age of coming out. And I used to get asked this question, like, Dr. Russell, are young people coming out at younger ages than before? And um, 10 years ago, the answer was, well, the fact that you're answer asking the question is the answer because there was no data. We have a little bit of data now of that, that documents this. And what I'm trying to do here is show you the average age of coming out across studies that ask that question about the age at which um, back in the day gay people came out and then more recently LGB and LGBT and LGBTQ young people. And you can see that sort of over time uh, in the 1970s, in the mid 1970s, Troyden's average age of coming out was just around 20 and you know we're now looking at ages about 14. The most recent studies are looking at about 14. Um, and so one of the things that I hear um, so much before last November maybe was, um, and I still hear, is like, aren't, isn't, you know, isn't, thing be aren't isn't everything better now? Especially after you know, June 2015, right, with, um, with, with federal marriage equality. Isn't, isn't everything better? Like, why, you know, what's the deal? Why are we still worried about risk? Why do we still keep talking about that? Um, isn't stuff better for young people? And um, for a while, and what I do in this article that's still, I think, fairly new, but, um, and I'm not rethinking this, but I, I try, I don't know if you can, let's see how you can see, how well you can see that. But I try to, um, in, the, in the article and in a couple of other 
writings, I make the case that um, we, there's uh, decades of developmental research that shows us that peer uh, attitudes and social regulation, especially regarding gender and sexuality, are heightened, particularly heightened, during early adolescence. And so what I'm trying to show with this blue is that there's this period of intensity, I mean, we, the gender intensification hypothesis, for example, that, um, and this is the MISH hypothesis, are people familiar with the MISH? Uh, that's the middle school is hell hypothesis. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, I, it's not really MISH, it, it'd be, anyway, but anyway, you get the idea. Um, the, there is a lot of, and, and I'm, I'm actually not, I'm not interested, uh, you know, I, I actually am interested, but I'm not a neuroscientist, but like everything from neuro to cognitive to uh, social to interpersonal to cultural to political economic studies in the United States point to adolescence as a period a, a, and the structure of our school systems. Everything we do in this culture anyway creates a system where whether it's organic or whether it's cultural structured, culturally uh, situated, uh, adolescence is a period where understanding and accepting differences is something that is developmentally um, distinct, distinctive. Um, and we have a lot of data that show that. And so what, I'm, what, I, what I had argued in this paper is that I think that there's a developmental collision between the, age of, the younger age of coming out and what's happening in schools. Uh, that means that, this is a, that things are not just simply getting better. Um, that actually that it's a particularly important <coughs> developmental period that is colliding with these his social historical changes. And What's really cool is I'll show you some, you know, now some very brand new, well, so the, the, before I show you that. So are things changing? So the, the question I get a lot of, are things changing? Are things, you know, are things better? Are things getting better? Uh, are they not getting better? And then, of course, the more important question for all of us is like, well, if they are, then how? How are things changing? And in what ways are they getting better? And I'm, you know, juxtaposing these dramatic changes in social acceptance and the younger ages that are coming out. Um, and so some colleagues and I, Elizabeth Sawick at the University of British Columbia and a former PhD student of mine that was a postdoc with her and uh, a postdoc with Jessica Fish, it was like the small world of the academic uh, intermarriages and collaborations, have started to think about like, if that's the case, shouldn't the disparities, shouldn't dispar if things are getting better, shouldn't the disparities that we see in, um, in uh, LGBT youth health be narrowing over time. Shouldn't we making? Shouldn't we be get, Shouldn't things be getting better? You know, like objectively, uh, for health, health and health behavior. And I'm just going to show you. This is, just came out in Addiction, uh, the, which is the journal, the substance use journal. That's, that, that's, that's the name of the journal. <laughs> is Addiction <laughs> anyway? Um, and this is just showing you. And I could show you. I thought about just like showing you picture after picture, but this is just showing you. Um, cigarette use using the British Columbia Adolescent Health Survey, which is um, over those four time points, 99,000 kids, so about 25,000 kids each time they have done the survey in these five-year increments. And the thing that's important to me, a couple things. Um, alcohol use, cigarette use, tobacco use, disordered eating, depression, suicide, all of these things, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Alcohol use and cigarette use have declined over time in the United States, but also in these data in British Columbia. So this is the good news. The overall good news for adolescent health is that you see this downward trend overall, right? So this is good. <laughs> it's good for everybody. We see the trend across all groups. But the trend is less strong. The downward trajectory is less strong for LGBT young people. And within your comparisons show elevated alcohol, cigarette use among LGBT youth compared to heterosexual kids for each of the four survey years, and especially in the most recent years, and especially among females. So this disparity is not getting better. And I mean, actually, it's getting worse. <laughs> and so this is, you know, this is British Columbia data. Um, this is the first of a series of papers. We're going to have probably by the time we're done, um, you know, probably seven or eight articles that are going to come out on this is British Columbia data. But we're showing this with disordered eating, with depression and suicide. Um, we're starting to show it in US data of adults using the behavioral risk factor surveillance system. We're also showing. Um, interestingly, we're showing de uh, uh, 
uh, the same pattern for victimization, for overall victimization, that overall victimization is declining over time, at least in the British Columbia data. Um, it's a little bit more complicated in the United States and U.S. data. Um, but we see, that, and that's general victimization, we see a really different pattern for homophobic victimization, and Russ Toomey and I have shown in a meta-analysis uh, of studies of homophobic, homophobic victimization and bullying that um, it looks like, based on the um, meta-analysis of available studies, which is really only about 17 studies for that, about, it was 17 studies um, in the meta-analysis, that, that there, it looks from those 17 studies that uh, the effect sizes are getting stronger rather than weaker. Um, so there's a complicated story, and I guess what I want to suggest is that um, there are, have been dramatic social, legal policy, structural social changes that make a difference, especially in the lives of adults, for sort of the objective reality of many LGBTQ people. Um, young people are coming out at younger ages, but homo, homo and transphobia is pervasive and perhaps increasing in adolescents' lives. And so we're, not, we're, we're seeing that these disparities aren't getting any better, and there seems to be some evidence that even though victimization and bullying at the population level seems to be going down, discriminatory homophobic bullying uh, may, be on the, may be increasing. And I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit at the very end of the paper to show you some of the brand new data that we're working on that as well. So, um, so that's, that's I, I'm thinking, I'm, you know, I'm thinking and writing about that right now, because I'm trying to, to try to sort of bring all of that together to make sense of how can we help uh, the general public, how can we contribute to a discourse that's, that, that, um, uh, that challenges the simplistic, it's all, it, it gets better, and actually trivializing and um, insulting uh, discourse for young people that somehow it'll all be fine if you just, you know, wake up in your 20s as a middle class you know, white man. Um, <laughs> so we need to. So we need to fix that. So I'll be. I'm interested in your take on this, and I'm. And I'm then. I'm interested in figuring out. You know, if I can. If I can. Pull all the pieces together. If I could come up with the right. The, I'm. I'm piecing together data, uh, sources and pa and pa trends across different populations and different sources of data, which I think is exciting and compelling. And I'm now thinking about like, how would I operationalize this in a study, you know, of in a population study of uh, kids and their lives. So, okay. So, what about resilience? So this is my, I, and this is the part where I was um, in my, you know, press to get here and fatigue. I'm like, okay, what? I really do want to unpack the, the reality that, you know, despite all of these trends, you know, the dilemma in showing all of these data is that the majority of kids are doing well, and the majority of kids are fine and are thriving. Um, and so, how do we understand, you know, who those kids are and what they're, what characterizes their lives? And some of you, are there people here who are experts in resilience or who've studied deeply resilience? Are there any psychologists? Anyone else? <laughs> I know you are. Because this is the part, this is the vulnerability part of the talk. This is the, like, I've got to be resilient. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of, because, I, I mean, as you all know, resilience as you, well, you might not all know, but you know, you're, I'm talking to people in a school of education and to psychologists and such, but resilience means a lot of different things and it's a really messy, uh, we, don't, we don't treat resilience particularly well as a construct across our different fields, and so I'm, I'm treading lightly when I say resilience, so I'll be interested in your take on this. But I am thinking of the definition of resilience that doesn't just mean doing well, it doesn't just mean positive development, it means doing well in the face of adversity or doing well um, uh, in the context where you've been challenged in some way. Um, and I know that um, there's a rich literature on sort of what we mean by, and there's a big, and there's rich actually just debate about what resilience means and how it would, what it would look at across time in the in individual person's life, in multiple domains and challenges. And so what I'm gonna do, what I wanna do, my question is, you know, who, among LGBTQ young people who does well in the context of minority stress. And I'll briefly, uh, I, I won't give a, I don't have time to really talk deeply about the theory of minority stress, but I think many people are exposed to the, the ideas of minority stress theory, and uh, I can share that. Many people in the room can share that with you afterwards if you're interested, but the, ge the general idea being uh, 
minority stress that that minority stress th that stress that is distinctive to your minority status uh, gets in the way of optimal development and optimal health status uh, for minority people. It, the minority stress theory was originally sort of conceptualized uh, to understand mental he mental health vulnerability of LGB populations uh, in its first sort of iterations by Elon Meyer and the great thing that makes it theory, I think, is that it's been taken up across other sort of minority statuses and other contexts and other domains to, to conceptualize and think about what is it about being a minority uh, person. And the nice thing about the theory, I think, as a sociologist coming at the theory uh, to try to understand individual health and mental health, is that it really does uh, help us account for the complicated inter intra personal and social and cultural factors that uh, contextualize the life of a minority person and the, the potential for their vulnerability. So my, the, the way that I'm approaching resilience today in this room and with my two uh, colleagues that I'm working on this paper and analysis with is um, for LGBTQ young people is doing well in the context of minority stress. Um, and then with Charlotte Patterson's lab, we were talking about what is minority stress? That's another whole conversation like, how do we measure minority stress? What does it look like to actually measure that? So um, what I will show you today is some data from a sample uh, that I just realized I don't have the acknowledgement slide for NIMH. Oops, okay, well, I, I am acknowledging support and funding from the National Institute of Mental Health and my colleague Arnie Grossman, who, uh, who is my collaborator in this study. But I'm, I'll present uh, data from a sample that started with 1,061 LGBTQ uh, same -sex and same-sex attracted young people who were 15 to 21 when we started. Uh, and I'm gonna just present the first of four waves of longitudinal data. We, we completed data collection just over two years ago and we are just, the first papers are coming out on this study or have come out, but um, and we recruited LGBTQ young people from community-based agencies and college groups from three cities um, in United States, and um, I was I've said, told several of you, remind me to, like somebody shake me before I go out and decide I'm gonna do another longitudinal study of LGBTQ young people. <laughs> or it, it, like, uh, I have been a social demographer my whole career, and the idea that I thought it was gonna be fun to collect data. Oh my gosh. It is so hard to like track young people and you know keep them involved and <laughs> try to learn about their lives. Um, so, uh, for, for today, the analytic sample is 835 of the LGBTQ cisgender young people, which means that I'm not including uh, transgender or same-sex attracted heterosexual kids, and I can talk more about that uh, in, in the analyses today. And this is the sort of distribution. It is, um, you know, by virtue of having collected the data in the Southwest and the West Coast, um, we have a, a remarkably ethnically diverse sample of young people. Um, and, um, yeah, so that's, that's to give you an idea. Because you need to know, uh, we're using the BEC depression inventory for youth and the um, negative suicide ideation subscale of the PANSY, the positive and negative suicide inventory. Um, I love calling it a PANSY. And <laughs> here's how we're thinking about minority stress. I'm kind of gonna be fast here. Um, we are, we have uh, the measure of coming out stress, LGB coming out, I'm calling it coming out stress. Margie Rosario calls it the gay related stress scale. The items are, are about stress related to disclosure of, uh, of sexual identity uh, to family members and friends. So we call it, uh, we're, we're, I'm, I conceptualize that as coming out stress. We have a measure of lifetime sexual orientation victimization, which is uh, vi verbal, physical, sexual victimization uh, due to, that is attributed by the respondent to uh, their sexual identity. <laughs> And then we have um, sexual orientation, gender identity, bullying at school, bullying and harassment um, at school. And I I'll say quickly, um, you know, I'm glad to share versions of this. We, we do have a draft of the paper, but these are the strongest correlation is between the two forms of victimization, and it's like 0.3. So these are these are distinct. They are not they're they're correlated, but they're distinct uh, constructs that we're trying to get at minority stress. And one of the things that I was challenging Jason to do is to be the person who helps us in the next 10 years from now. I hope that we can say we have like field agreement on what minority stress is and how to measure it. But at least with respect to young people, this is sort of, this is the state of the, of the field four years ago when we designed the survey as we were going into the field to, uh, to survey these young people. 
And then I've been thinking about like the, um, so I, I didn't, I guess, so yes, so I've been thinking about the, you know, what should, what, what would the correlates of resilience look like? Um, and you know, I, number one, we're conceptualizing uh, mental health as a, I, I'm thinking of resilience in the context of mental health and um, I think having a positive sense of self uh, is sort of a baseline that I want to account for in understanding, uh, in understanding resilience to minority stress for sexual minority kids. But especially I'm interested in the factors amenable to change that um, might be present in their lives that we could potentially activate uh, to make a difference. And so we're specifically looking at LGBT community resources, um, three questions or th categories, time spent with LGBT people, whether there's a gay-straight alliance or a gender sexualities alliance in their school or it was in their school when they went to school, and whether they're a participant or member of the local community-based organization. Glad to see you all here today. Um, and then also um, interpersonal social support. Um, and this is from the, the CAS. Does anybody know what the CAS? I should, I'm slightly like blanking it in my mind. But anyway, child, yes, child, yes, child adolescent social support scale. Thank you. It's completely obvious, but um, that has dimensions for parents, teachers, classmates, and close friends. And so this is LGB specific uh, resources that are uh, grounded in the interpersonal community context, and this is generalized social support social support, that, so it's not specific social support to being an LGBT person. And here's what our analytic approach is, and this is the part that makes me nervous, but I think it's cool if, it, you, know, if you don't really hate it. Um, so what we did is we estimated residual scores for depression and suicide ideation with minority stress as a predictor. I'm not sure, I'm interested in that there's not that many people who are actually, that use residuals, that, that actually te like to treat residuals as data. So the residuals are the error that come out of your regression models, right? The regression model predicts the population average and gives you parameter estimates that on, the, on average in the population should predict the outcome, in this case depression and suicide ideation. The residual is the error for any given, any individual kid. And it occurs to me that that error represents for that kid the degree to which minority stress is not predicting their depression and suicide. So we're estimating the residual score. I'm getting some nods, so please, <laughs> this is good. Thank you. Um, thank you for the positive reinforcement. Um, we're saving the residual values, which you can do, um, and you can use them. It's not, in, it's not evil. Uh, and it's just numbers, right? It's just numbers. And we recode them so that the high score equals a lower actual than predicted value. So it means that your actual value on depression or suicide ideation is lower than the value that would be predicted for your case based on your constellation of minority stress. So it's just your, and this is what it, well. And then we estimate, the, then we use that in a regression model to, to predict. We, you, we predict the residual scores using the mental health, use, controlling for mental health, but then also looking at community resources and social support. That's the concept, but there are a couple flaws maybe. But, so the analytic approach, this is the base model that predicts depression and suicide ideation using the three uh, minority stress measures. And what you see basically is that interestingly, the, or, or perhaps not, the har harassment um, is not a strong predictor, but violent experiences, uh, violent victimization, uh, well, it's, I sh it should be victimization experiences, some of which are violent. And uh, coming out stress are both positively associated with bad things, as you might imagine. The thing that well, you can ask me questions later methodologically, but I, we've thought about this up and down and backwards and forwards, but um, this is the baseline model that we use to, to calculate the residuals. I'm gonna give you the illustration of what the depression residual looks like. So you notice the R-square wasn't huge, and you see that we have a big distribution. And yet, you know, there is a pretty clear regression line that says that we are predicting uh, but what I want to show you is a couple things. First, this is, the, this is zero, where actually most young people's predicted values are low or zero or lower. So we're under predicting, you know, minority stress is under predicting how well LGBTQ young people are doing. So there's a bunch of other stuff that we're not capturing in minority stress that's going on that's, that, that is explaining this, uh, this levels of depression for LGBTQ young people. So I'm acknowledging that, right? Minority stress is obviously a small part of a bigger puzzle, um, but I'm trying to isolate that here. This is like a clinical level. Of, I'm gonna kind of leave that out. But what I wanna show here with the shaded boxes, these, these are the, th this is result, this was, is what I'm calling 
uh, resilience. These are the kids whose um, predicted values are lower uh, than their actual values. And some of these, you know, these are big outliers. Like, who are these kids and what characterizes their experience? And so here's the model moving forward that predicts resilience. So tell me what you think. First, um, it is, by the way, Bisexual Awareness Week. And today is International Bisexual Awareness Day. Yay! <laughs> and we should be aware, having said that, celebrated that, we should be aware that bisexual young people are underrepresented among the kids who are, uh, are, are resilient to depression. Um, older kids are more likely to be resilient to depression. So that's, that's, and then black and multiracial kids are underrepresented among kids who are resilient to suicide ideation. And then, um, not surprisingly, uh, self-esteem is positively associated with uh, these measures of resilience, and depression is negatively re related to resilience. But the things I especially care about, and we can, we can, I can talk about all that in the conceptualization behind all of that if you'd like, but the thing I care about is this interesting pattern here, that, that social support from parents and from classmates um, is, is correlated with uh, resilience to depression. Whereas on the other hand, it's um, uh, having a GSA and spending time in a community organization that is uh, associated with resilience to suicide ideation um, in these analyses. Okay. I'm just going to like pause for just a second. So think about this, this pattern, which I was not expecting, and I think it's pretty interesting. Social support and depression, community and community engagement. And really, it's not, it's not time spent with friends. It's really these two that have to do with sort of social structures, institutional spaces that are affirming and engaging of LGBTQ young people that are associated with resilience to suicide. I'm what I'm calling resilience a low residual score on suicide ideation. So um, what could this mean? And this is, you know, what I'm then thinking about. Like, it, it occurs to me that the parents and classmates are really normative social supports that all kids, that should, that ought to be a fundamental baseline for all kids, uh, all young people, right? I mean, we, you, that's like, that's completely normative and expected that you would have uh, th that kind of support. And so, um, which seems to me quite different from the, the community organization, um, community or school organization uh, engagement uh, that, and, and makes me think about sort of like, um, I, I'm interested in talking with psychologists then about the difference between depression and, and self-harm and suicidal ideation and what that, you know, why. Uh, it, the depression result totally makes sense to me, right, that we would need social support to feel, you know, good about the core of ourselves. Um, and I'm really interested that community engagement may be a strategy to reduce, you know, the potential for self-harm, especially among the kids who are the most vulnerable, right, meaning LGBTQ kids. And then, of course, the implications being like, how do we provide, uh, how do we activate social support in the lives of kids? Because the, the, also remember, it's, it's, it's the most normative social support. It's not teachers. It's like, it's classmates and parents. It's not best friends. It's like the generalized other in school and your parents that seem to be the ones that who we need to activate. If you know you're going to take my little regression coefficients like with some seriousness. So I'm interested in that. Okay, the data are cross-sectional, so we're going to be testing this over time. We do we do lose kids over time, which is a tragedy of longitudinal data collection. Um, and it's self-reported data, and that's you know a thing. And we were just talking about this. Like, what does that mean? Um, so here are some thoughts I have about this, uh, about sort of bringing it all together. But this might not be in the right. Let me just do this quickly for myself and see if this works. Yes, it does. Okay, I just want to make sure that's still there because I'm going to come back to some other idea. Um, I think you know, I've been thinking about this. Uh, developmental, this, this thing I've been calling a developmental collision that young people are coming out at younger ages in a society that's increasingly supported, that we think of, as inc that we like to believe is increasingly supportive, and objectively in many ways obviously is, um, and that, but that I'm concerned that the age of coming out is like a colliding 
uh, with a developmental period that's characterized by social, interpersonal, peer regulation, uh, and that this broad perception of social progress might not be applicable to adolescents. And, and you know, I think we're seeing evidence of that in not just non-decreasing, but actually growing, widening disparities uh, over time uh, from the data that we have. And I showed you data from Canada. We've got data that's going to come out from the United States. Um, but that kids can, that, that some forms of interpersonal and contextual support, young people will thrive. And that's like super exciting to me about like what do we, how do we activate that? And um, so, in a, in a way, and then I, and when I was thinking about coming to Youth Next, I was thinking this is you know this is sort of this is uh, this is positive light because I'm still I'm I'm still trying to get around uh, depression and suicide ideation and and um, but you know the, uh, there is a whole research literature on sort of what we can do to create uh, safe and supportive environments and and I have my team and I was sharing I have a whole new research agenda around community-based organization participation because we 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 know in community work that it works. And we don't have a lot of empirical evidence like this that documents the ways, the context, the meanings, the, uh, the mechanisms uh, for, for that work. Um, so we're thinking about that. I've been doing research on GSAs uh, for a long time. And I'll show you some brand new, uh, uh, some new, so, so moving away from the focus on an individual kid and the individual, the, the factors in, in kids' lives that might uh, prompt their, uh, might be correlated with their resilience. So thinking again, moving back to the population level, this is the amazing thing about having done this for a very long time. I was involved in the late 90s in advocacy for a question on homophobic bullying on the California Healthy Kids Survey. And some in rockin' young people went to Sacramento every year and, and in, the, in the 80s and 90s and argued for the, the need to document what was going on in schools for LGBTQ young people. And starting way back then, they, asked, they added a question to the California Healthy Kids Survey that's like, have you, have you been bullied or harassed because you're gay or lesbian or someone thought you were? They've asked that for now over 15 years. And I have all this data, and I'm a data geek. And now it's millions of young people because in the last year that they collected the data, it was 900,000 students, 970,000 kids. So it's millions and millions of kids we have now in California. And this is the trend for homophobic bullying. Does anybody want to tell me what they see? I've, I've given you a big hint with that line in the middle, but what do you see from this? There's a peak in homophobic bullying. Can you see? Is it too small to see? This is 2008. That's Prop 8. Yeah, that is Prop 8. So my amazing grad student that, is, that grew up in a country that was not the United States, I said, let's look at the trend. We need to look at the trend in homophobic bullying. We haven't done this yet. And she came to the lab meeting and she said, you know, there's, I don't know, there's something weird about the data. I'm not sure. And I said, well, what? You know, and she's presenting. She said, there's just this thing like it, it doesn't, it's not right. There's like this very clear peak in homophobic bullying. And we're like, oh, that's a shame. Like maybe the data are weird. Or maybe there's something wrong. She said, yeah, it peaked in 2008. And every, <laughs> all of the grad <laughs> students in the room were like, what? What? And we have this moment of like, could you sh show us the data? Like what? Um, wow, prop, prop eight. Well, so we have this paper that's, that's under review right now. I'm really, really super excited about this paper because it happens that I also have data from the Gender, Sexual Gender Sexuality Alliance Network GSA census that they have collected since the late 90s, every school in California that has a registered GSA with their organization. And the number of GSAs in California has been has been growing since the late 90s. And what we're showing in this paper that's completely unbelievable is that this is the curve of homophobic bullying for schools that had GSAs in California. And we've used four different statistical methods to document because we've had this review that made us like seven page, single space pages of review, of, of you know, critique from six reviewers um, in Nature Human Development <laughs> asking us, uh, suggesting four different statistical methods to d document in every single one that the peak in homophobic bullying is statistically meaningful in 2008 only for schools that don't have GSAs. And that this is essentially the best fitting curve for the schools that have GSAs is a linear one. 
So this is super exciting to me because it's like some of the first that I've seen with respect to um, LGBTQ lives and homophobia, um, data that would suggest a social intervention influence on structural stigma. Um, so I'm super, super excited about this. Um, so stay tuned and, you know, Mimi, don't tweet. I know Mimi and I know she's a tweeter, so don't tweet this because it's not published yet. But, you know, talk about it and think about like, and imagine if we had similar data on community-based organization participation, would that, this is, this is homophobic bullying in schools, but if, if we think about um, what are the factors that might actually make a dent in structural stigma, I'm so excited about this at, you know, having the potential to uh, advance a discourse of like the public discourse, so <laughs> to come back to the present, the public discourse makes a difference in the lives of kids. And so one of the things we're now doing, we're trying to do, what's happened in the period of the time of this data collection, most of this data collection, for, you know, before about here was uh, fill in the bubble in classroom surveys. And what you can imagine is in the more recent years, in about, I think he said, um, my data friend said it was about 2012 that in California it switched from um, majority pen paper pencil to majority electronic administration. And in more recent years, so we had only had like school year to go from. In more recent years with electronic surveys, they're all date stamped. And so one of the things that we, we that they, the California Ki Healthy Kids Survey includes a question about religious discrimination, religious bullying, and race bullying. And so we're really interested in last fall um, and uh, just look at patterns of, of, well, not just last fall, but you know, you, there are plenty of time. Like we, we don't have data that's sensitive enough in 2000, uh, 2001 to 9-11, um, which is, we were, which is, we've thought about that. But there are other big moment, cultural moments that we think are important. Um, so I'd be interested in the kinds of, you know, kinds of youth studies that were ongoing in Charlottesville and in, in Central Virginia and around the world in this last several months to see, if, to see the degree to which we can detect the social discourse uh, and the way that it matters for young people and um, the way that it contributes to structural stigma and, and undermines young people's well-being. So, um, okay, I think maybe I have a, I'm just going to stop that. Go, I'm just going to stop now. Go to the end. Um, so I, I, di the, the, I, I do. I, I, I'll stop and say another talk I might have given would have been about everything we've learned in schools in the last decade um, about school policies, practices, and programs that are making a difference to create supportive environments for LGBTQ and all young people. And I do have this new book, which I should, you know, what, what do you, you know, sell to you all or something, but. I, or at least, at least tell you about because this that the school area, and it's one of the reasons I one of my you know one of the reasons I study gay straight alliances is because I got involved in education research on LGBTQ issues <laughs> in schools. But that is a domain where we actually know more than I think anything else with respect to sexual orientation, gender identity, and adolescent health and well-being. And so um, next time I'll talk about everything we know um, in in, edu in the education context. But I'll stop there and. Maybe we'll have a discussion about LGBTQ health and resilience. Yeah, that is great. Well, let's let's talk about that because you know the, the one idea might be to figure out if we could do that longitudinally with this data. That could, that's an idea. Um, I was having a conversation earlier this morning about like at you know perception and attribution and um, how do we you know what is objective and what is real um, in terms of how we understand our experiences. And I guess I would say. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know how, I, I, you know, I think we would need multiple vantage points on kids' experiences to understand, and you know, to make sense of that. Of resilience. Right, right. It's a, it's a really cool question. I mean, I can, I can imagine ways that, in the limitations of the study, that I could try to, 
try to get at pieces of that, but it, it would certainly would require sort of other, um, you know, other kinds of data, um, independent of self-report. Um, but it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a cool question. It's a good question. And, and I also think, you know, I, I'm, I'm a defender of, of young people's self-reports, you know, um, um, that, you know, but n knowing that there is, there's variability in the degree to which kids would understand their experience. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So did your data show, like, the location or where the, where the person's from that's filling up the survey, like urban or rural or, you know, like? Yeah. It, um, for you mean for the California Health for that big huge large trend trend well, data. data? Yeah. I know like even outside of Charlotte, like if you're back in the you know, more rural areas, I'm sure the attitudes and um, ability and self esteem is gonna be treated differently where there's different outlets or different public community views. Yeah. And the data I presented on resilience, the, the prospective study of the eight hundred young people from were the, those data were collected in three cities. Um, three urban areas. It's a long-standing dilemma in research, in, in all research, that, that rural lives are underrepresented in general. Um, and that's, that's true of our study. Um, I will say that it's, you know, the, th the thing that I am proud of is like the first, the first study that I know of that is not based only on the coasts or Chicago. Uh, and, you know, the fact that there's a southwestern site is, you know, is, is new, and there are differences across those sites. Um, uh, perhaps most interesting, you know, the, the northeastern site, the young people in the, or participants in the study were more advantaged sort of in all ways and showed less vulnerability um, than was true on the west coast site and in the southwestern site. Um, and there were some interesting differences between the west and the south coast, like the, I mean, w southwest and the west coast site. Um, I think that on the, anyway, there's some interesting differences. Uh, I think that the kinds of, um, the, the southwestern, the kids at the southwestern site were clearly more vulnerable on, on all the indicators of mental, mental, mental health. But uh, there was sort of a different level of economic uh, uh, vulnerability on the west coast site. So, um, so there's diversity. And we, we always, you know, that's interesting. I should, like, look at site differences and the resilience. I haven't done that. So the, with the California data, there are, you know, all that data are embedded in, the Cal, in that huge California study because the, the data are statewide. Um, uh, and um, well, I was just having a conversation earlier today about that kind of vulnerability, var variability. Um, I do have a new study that's, that's under review right now that just looks at the demographics of gay straight alliances, for example, because one of the things people have said is like, oh, isn't that just suburban white kids? And the, we, we have a paper documenting that at least the most recent data in California for contemporary young people, uh, gay straight alliances, GSAs, uh, seem to be almost completely equal opportunity around the state. They are equally likely in small schools and large schools and rural schools and urban schools and, and high free reduced lunch schools and low free reduced lunch schools. So um, there's some, that's California and that's a place where the movement for GSA inclusion started, you know, before other places in the country. So, um, so anyway, I'm thinking about those things. It's a, it's a great question and I do, you know, I think we don't know enough. I mean, there's always more to be understood about that. Your discussion was a lot of the fears about the gay straight alliances, but do you think that with regards to the homophobic bullying schools that are more likely to have a gay straight alliance would also just be more likely to be not um, bullying or isolate that more than the South Beach? So we've thought about doing all this kind of cross-lag stuff to see. Um, and one of the reasons we did the demographics of GSAs was to try to get at the, like, are some schools just better than others and are they more likely to have GSAs? Um, and at some level, um, at some existential level, ultimately the way, where I come down on it is like, they seem to make a big difference in schools. And uh, sort of like, we're not gonna ever have a randomized control trial where we, 
randomly assigned some kids to schools that had GSAs and not. Um, <laughs> because we're just not going to do that. So it, that's not feasible and it's not desirable. So um, that's why I think that the most absolutely massively broad population level s s science that can, sh that can document those differences is really important. And I should say in the, in the trend analysis, we have controlled for um, some really basic things that we have data on schools, like si enrollment size and percent of kids that receive free and reduced lunch. Um, which is sort of like the one, two of the, th two of the only things that are kind of consistently collected in California at the school level. I mean, that there's administrative data for. So, but it's a good, it's a good point. Yeah. yeah. So, in the GSA finding, I'm thinking about is it something, or the, is the presence of the GSA creating some sort of social climate, or is it actually that the kids are engaged with the GSA in some way? So yes. Do you know if the kids are engaged with it, or whether it's just like, okay, it's there, so that signals something about the school? Yes. This is a really, there's a robust, you know, uh, set of study, science, you know, literature that's coming out on GSAs in general. It's kind of interesting that there's like a whole group of people studying GSAs, but this data is completely, the, the, the survey data doesn't have anything about GSAs in it, and I match the survey's schools with the GSA census, so it's completely independent. Um, so we don't know about GSA participation. That's one thing that's pretty exciting to me about the finding, that this is homophobic bullying as reported by the school population <laughs> and independent data about whether or not the school had a GSA. There is a great, there's a whole group of studies now, and I can point them to, if you're interested in, in GSA. I mean, I think for Youth Next, GSA as a, as a space for uh, thinking it for where young people are thinking about social justice and social change is like a really great, you know, like example of that kind of space. And we have, for some reason, a lot more research on GSAs than we have on Black Student Alliances or La Raza groups and schools. And that's like a, a limitation of the, the current science. Okay, but the point is, there's really good um, studies that are showing us both at the at using individual student reports across schools and data that is comparing differences across schools that show the presence of a GSA and GSA participation both have independent positive association for student well-being. So, and for uh, LGB students and for all students in schools. So there, like, there's really good data on this now that's showing that just simply having one is associated with kind of mean level positive uh, environments in schools, it's positive school climates in schools. And Laura Shalaha showed that in 2003 using data from 2000 in Massachusetts that like the diversity climate in Massachusetts schools was rated as uh, more positive. The diversity climate, including race, ethnicity, gender, was rated as more climate, more positive in schools that had a, just simply had a GSA present um, in Massachusetts schools. And there's also then good work that suggest, that shows that then among students in schools, those that are members, uh, get some sort of safety benefit uh, from participation and membership in a GSA. And so Paul Petit at Boston College is really has a uh, uh, NIMH grant right now where he's doing a GSA, an intensive uh, GSA study where he's trying to then unpack what it is about uh, the context and content of experience in GSAs that is making a difference. Um, because I mean, even I think, like, really, like, how good can one school club be? I mean, it's kind of amazing, but I, uh, over and over again, the very f early, early data from California that we were collecting through schools was showing that one of the most important and consistent differences was whether or not the, a, a kid said they had a GSA or whether or not we could uh, identify that there was a GSA in a school for, for student differences. And uh, so I th the, the other thing about GSAs is that the history of them is that they are spaces that are youth-led. There's not really a curriculum for GSAs. And so the, for, theoretically, they're really an important, from a youth developmental perspective, they're you know, an important um, idea that I think we need to, that would be great for us to kind of explode on. Yeah, Jason? This question is, I'm trying to think if this question is distinct from the, what you just said, but I'm um, about like what, how, why, why are GSAs making a difference? But I'm wondering, um, like if looking at the spatial interrogation that schools that have GSAs, maybe why some GSAs are making I'm so glad you asked that question. So I have the most cool new data 
I'm like such a data collector. I can't, and I go to meetings and I come back and my team is like, please don't tell us you found new data. But um, <laughs> so in the category of being an um, advocate activist scholar, footnote, another whole long conversation that we should have someday, I, I uh, did volunteer work for um, the GSA network in California for more than a decade. They collected data every year. At the, they, they called it their year-end survey. They sent a survey to all of the GSA presidents in California about, it was just a simple survey, a two-pager that said like, did your GSA, but it asked us a couple of important questions. Did your GSA improve the school climate? Did your GSA address various, the items on the survey changed over the years. Like some, some years they asked, they, they introduced a question about marriage equality, for example, in California GSA. And um, they asked about the numbers of activities and the kinds of activities GSA did every year. And then they asked some administrative questions like what kinds of things do you need from GSA network? And did you come to our website? And did you, you know, are there things that we can do to support your GSA? They, I used to receive um, boxes of surveys and my undergraduate students at University of Arizona would enter the data and we would generate a report every year for GSA Network about their year-end survey. And it was a, just a service I did and I wrote one book chapter where I referred to some of the data and I just, it was something I did because my students loved it, undergraduate students loved seeing how research worked and they loved, they, you know, were tormented by entering that much data. But they loved, they, they thought it was fun and they, you know, they learned like the idea that you, like how you went from like a survey in a box to a report to a, you know, to a community organization that they could use for their planning and action. Well, fast forward a decade later, we have an archive of the activities of GSAs. So we've now matched that data. I have a paper that's in progress right now that Salvatore Iberno is the postdoc who's the lead on this paper where we've looked at the, what we're calling the GSA climate of schools, which is the sort of like the GSA contributed to positive climate, the GSA contributed to safety, the GSA contributed to social change and social justice, and GSA activities, numbers of activities, like we did these things, and how often did we do them? We did an assembly, we met with our teachers, we met with the school administration, because we're trying to think about these questions about like what is it about being in a GSA? Super, super interesting. Um, super excited. This is so we're matching that to the cal to the independent data, not from kids in GSAs, but to the independent data where we've got schools mean level. We're aggregating all these student reports um, from the California Healthy Kids Survey, and the short story is we're finding that it's the GSA, um, it's the climate of the GSA rather than the sheer um, numbers, uh, the sheer sort of like volume impact of a GSA that seems to be what makes a difference for the, the average school assessment of school safety and homophobic bullying. So did that make sense? So it's not like how much they're doing, it's whether, they, whether the GSA president um, uh, uh, perceives that the impact is positive. Um, that is independently correlated. I'm so excited about this. I think it's so cool. Um, so it's the story of like, you know, stay in the field long enough and be a data geek for long enough and um, get your, you know, hands m messy with weird data from good friends who are trying to do the right thing in community organizations for long enough that um, it's become an archive that I think is really going to be really cool. So I don't know if I think that answers some of your question, but I'd, I'll sh share that. That's, that's one of the papers that is in the stack that I left somewhere on this campus uh, <laughs> that I have my handwritten notes on. So I've got to get that paper back because Salvatore is going to be so mad if I don't do the edits on that paper. Yeah. What, what was the question? What was that paper? Because I think the biggest <laughs> <laughs> If you found my stack of papers, talk to me later because I'm still looking for my stack of papers. Okay, all I yeah. found was a stack of papers. So I was wondering if it was Good. yours. <laughs> Maybe that's my papers. I hope that's my papers. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. perfect. That's uh, great. I do have a question. Yeah, okay. Um, um, so how do you think that having a GSA relates to hopefulness for the future? So when you were showing us the residual data, uh, there was a relationship between, uh, for suicide ideation, but not depression symptoms. And uh, one big difference between suicide ideation and depression symptoms is you won't hear it. You probably aren't thinking about telling your parents. Or like, I love that. Will you like? Are you going to get married someday? Are you going to have kids someday? Are you going to 
have all these formative um, Love that. I don't know, I love that, but we have that data. <laughs> we totally have that data, so let's talk about that. I, I, that's really great. That's a really great idea. I mean, that, the link to hopefulness is terrific. Thank you. Yeah, I'll do this, and then Charlotte, do, you and Charlotte, yeah. Um, something about a fun situation. So I'm a former public school teacher myself. I used to transfer career teachers. Uh, but looking at the big impact on the different pressures and the different aspects, there's a creative climate in terms of Do you have a sense of what mechanism or what reason there might be for why that? No. I mean, I don't know. Do you? I mean, I, that seriously, I mean, in a lot of other work, teachers emerge as the important, um, in the, I mean, it may be because this is like emotional health and not like school safety and readiness or well-being. So, I mean, one could, I could look at that, but yeah. Well, I'm wondering how the question was asked regarding teachers, because like I'm, I'm used to imagining the school that I came from, but the school that my friend works at, um, growing up kind of in the neighborhood of my rural schools, especially where like I was a teacher who was very markedly in support of students who were LGBTIQ like socially or identified. But there were also many people in the school who were like in an awkward stance. And so I'm wondering if I can reach out to someone and I'm wondering how someone can ask a question based on that. That is a really great point because it's like the global teacher, and we and if we I bet if we'd asked about the bet the most important teacher, we would have like a really that's a really good point. And, and Thank you. That, yeah. Oh my gosh, that's so important, thank you, because um, absolutely in the literature on LGBT youth, one of the most important protective factors is having a, having a positive, important one teacher. And one of the things we hear over and over and over anecdotally and in lots of the data is that LGBT young people don't have good experiences with teachers, sort of globally. So that's, well, that's maybe, a little, that's maybe said a little bit too glibly, but um, report lots of negative experiences with teachers, or, or, the, or the bar for what a positive, maybe this is better, the bar for what's a good teacher for, for an LGBT student is so low that it's just heartbreaking, like what it means to feel supported by a teacher. So, yeah. So I now I can't ask you about, now we were just talking about the youth as measure, and there's one measure of social problems youth where you do have to speak to me about one individual in that category, and another one is global, and I can't remember any of the CASAs. The CASAs, I'm, is, is it it's global, global? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Charlotte, were you? Oh, I just wanted to say I was just so happy to see you turning the corner in this literature and studying these ladies. It's a wonderful thing to see after years and years and years of dread and dying and depression and suicide, which, you know, I'm not, not trying to say it's not real. Right. I mean, it's important that it's important to document it. And I remember years when 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 it was in the field was in denial about it. And, right. and it's been a very important part of this work to, to make that real. Um, but I'm wonder it's wonderful to see you turning the corner and talking about resilience, and I wanted to ask a couple questions about that. One is focused on the positive um, aspects of resilience. So one way to think about resilience is that you avoid negative outcomes. The way that you? Avoid negative outcomes, okay. like yeah. depressive, uh -huh. depressive uh -huh. symptoms, right. and so forth. Another way to think about it is that you're approaching more positive things. I think that's what you know, Doyle might have been yeah. at earlier. Um, and that's one question, are you, Balancing both of those in the work that you're doing, we saw the the first data. Yes, right, uh, right. But the other question is generated out of the fact that there were different predictors for different outcomes in your um, slide that, that you showed us earlier. Remember, depressive symptoms had one set of predictors, and the uh, suicidality had a different one. And that's an interesting finding, I think. And I'm wondering how you think about resilience. You know, we usually talk about it as a unitary thing. Is thriving, mm -hmm. I think. But those data don't they suggest a much more? Like, yeah, that 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 kind of especially. I mean, that's practically especially kind of what it would mean to uh, to be healthy in the face of it and of minority stress um, would be sort of domain or dimension specific. You know, that like we might need a different strategy to think about something like self harm than we would about depression. Um, yeah, absolutely, and I think that's kind of 
you know, what I'm trying to, that's, well, that's, this is the very beginning of trying to think in this way. Um, and your point, I, I think this is, I'm really, I, I, you know, we've started, you know, the, our, our study was to, we don't have a National Institute of Positive Health and Happiness. We have a National Institute of Health. And so, you know, we did start, I mean, honestly, this is where we're starting is with, like, understanding suicide. That was what we got, that's where the recent, that's what the urgency, and that is what's urgent. Um, and I'm interested in, you know, I haven't, I mean, I'm just honest, I'm being completely honest. I haven't thought about, like, what would it mean to, like, some of the measures that we do have, the positive development measures, like, what does it mean to <coughs> positive in the face of minority stress? I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess we could think, conceptualize it in the same way. I just hadn't really thought about, you know, I'm used to think of minority stress as being the most, the important correlate to negative things, but I hadn't thought about, like, so I am conceptualizing it as resilience to minority stress. So um, what would it mean to have mastery or to have, uh, uh, self-efficacy um, in the context of minority stress is a great, it's a great, uh, I need to think about that. Uh, maybe becoming an activist researcher? Yes, right. <laughs> maybe, yes, maybe, in fact, yeah. So. So, so, so thinking about that, I think if you think about sort of the individual context relation way in which thinking about then I think positive like what the, the, the learner is five C's of CYB, right? Which which would be also interesting to think about in the context of GSA, because if those five C's are present, the idea of increased contribution is the six C, which mm -hmm. feels linked to so I don't know, I think there's something very interesting about thinking about the positive And then some of the things you're measuring, like social support or organization, mm -hmm. would be ecological access. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. is there some mm -hmm. level of positive ecological access that can offset the stress that comes from the negative ecological access? Um, and maybe there's some interaction between the individual strengths that need to be in place and the ecological strengths that need to be in place. That's, that, I mean, I'm, I don't have a reaction besides like, this is, I'm writing, I'm taking notes. Uh, because that could be a, I mean, that could be a helpful frame for the whole approach. I mean, positive ecological assets and, and, res, and resilience to minority stress. And I'm gonna be, I'll think more, I, I need to think more. I need to, you know, sleep on the idea of minority stress as a correlate predictor of, of positive development and what that, you know, would, you know, what that would mean for this, for, for thinking in terms of this sort of like um, predicting resilience, like, like you could, I, so we could, anyway, I, I, this, I like that. That's, I'm, I keep looking over here, so I realize I should look at this side. There's maybe two here, or, and, and I'm aware it's 1218, um, and I know we go to 1230, but maybe people need to do things that it's okay if you get up and need to leave, so <laughs> do you want to ask a question? Yeah, um, so is there It would be ethical to assign students what randomly to like code with GSA and what code without GSA, but instead of doing that, is there like a reasoning or like um, a problem with the idea of taking all the schools that don't have GSA and randomly assigning them to create GSA by yeah. having at least one mm -hmm. supporting adult in mm -hmm. the school? That's a, that's a really cool idea. I mean, um, and it's not, it's not completely infeasible to imagine doing an intervention that would be to try to, uh, act to, to, to insert a GSA where it doesn't already exist. Um, the, the cup, the, so the, I mean, it's absolutely something that could, it's an interesting idea to try to do it. I mean, I guess um, the history of GSAs is that they are youth 
or, uh, organized and led. Not always, but, but um, typically. And there, are, there certainly is a history of some GSAs of a, a teacher feeling that there was a need for change who like decides they're going to start a GSA. They put up signs in the hallway and they go to the classroom every Tuesday, no matter what, at 4 o'clock. And they're there until young people start showing up. And there are a couple great stories of teachers that did that for like two years before anybody ever came. And they just said, we're going to have a GSA. Even if there's nobody in the GSA, we're going to have a GSA. So that, would be, that is a really different kind of model of what a GSA sort of typically feels like and how they start. But so that would be possible. And it would be interesting, you know, that's, it's, that's a cool idea to like, it, it would require then um, figuring out some strategy to recruit like the right, you know, flavor of person and timing and, that there, organizations like um, Gay Straight Alliance Network, uh, Gender Sexualities Alliance Network in California are actually working to identify schools and districts where they think they could make the most difference and then providing through the staff of their organization capacity and support in schools to make that happen. And so, um, you know, the person, there's there are a couple people that would be able to tell you how that works, you know, because they're trying to do it on the ground. Um, and so it would be interesting to, you know, I partner with them on this other kinds of data stuff, so it would be interesting to think about, like, what would it look like? The reality is that, you know, in a, it happens, like, and then there's, like, it just happens that I'm a researcher who has all these connections in California, and a lot, so many of the schools in California have GSAs. So it would be great to think about, like, is that, the, is that true in Virginia? Is there a GSA network, statewide GSA network in Virginia? There are, I don't know. Are, is there? There's not one. Yeah. <laughs> so it would be interesting to think about like what would that look like. I'm sure there are GSAs in Virginia. What I don't know is like whether they're organized or networked in any you know, coherent way and whether it would be possible to think about what would it look like, how would you design it to, you know. But th that's, a great, that's a great idea. Thank you for that. I mean, yeah. You know, yeah. I'm really happy that you're there. Well, I mean, you're you're asking all these questions about sort of digging further into the mechanisms behind these results, and I think it's really and it's um, you know the most productive conversations I have. I sorry to all my colleagues in the room. Not the most productive. <laughs> some of the most some of the most like <laughs> differently productive. Some of the most um, you know meaningful for asking the for for asking the right question come from conversations with like people that are doing GSA networks that are, that are like actually doing the GSA work that are working in community um, so it's that kind of question that prompts me to think about what I'm measuring and what I'm asking so thank you and um, thank you for doing the work and I mean thank you for what you're doing because it makes a big difference I mean I, I will take the privilege of a couple minutes just to say and one of the first results from this study where we were looking at the the critical predictors of depression, the minority stressors for depression and suicide risk for the young people in this study. Um, one of the things we found uh, about those measures of minority stress is that coming out stress um, was the strongest uh, predictor of depression and suicide ideation for girls, for young women, and not for men in the same way. And one of the things I have been thought about about that finding I can give you more information if you're interested, is the ways that, um, so I, I really want to talk with you after about like, like who's in those groups and the support groups and are they mostly boys or are they young women and in what ways have we historically, I, I know for sure in, in California and Arizona and Texas that coming out groups have been 
for boys. I mean, we have sort of conceptualized coming out as a problem for boys in a way we haven't for girls, and I'm really concerned by that finding that was published in Developmental Psychology a year and a half ago, that um, to what extent are we really engaging with young women about coming out? I, I think that I think my critique is that we have done that, we've, we've conceptualized that as really troubling and difficult for boys and not in the same way for girls, and I'm concerned about that, be, if that seems to be the driver if coming out stress seems to be the driver for girls in a way that's not the same for boys. So the, uh, anyway, just putting that out there for your work. And then, then me. So you talk, uh, you've been talking a lot about the gay straight alliance in the school context, and at some point very early on, you talk about how community organizations also played a role in that. Um, and uh, I know that in New York City, for example, uh, part of the high school experience, um, at, at least at some point. Um, but the community or organizations were critical and crucial in supporting um, youth who were sort of emerging and developing their identity. Um, I'm curious as to whether the, you think the importance of the Gay Straight Alliance is because they are in a school context, which creates sort of, sort of maybe a normalization of um, difference in a way that maybe community organizations don't. But then you also have positive effects for the community organizations. So I'm curious about how you're thinking about those globally. Yeah. Well, this finding is interesting, and I'm, it's like prompting me to think about all the dimensions of that. I mean, certainly the, the way that we have thought about and written about GSAs is that they, that they provide a number of different functions that they, that they provide uh, support, in, interpersonal support. They provide, uh, some of them provi are, are space for counseling. They provide uh, a social outlet and network just like any other club, or they are engaged in education, activism, and change in schools. And GSAs are different. You know, this is part of the dilemma is that they play different roles. But the sort of the gestalt of the GSA literature is that GSAs are playing this, and, and that we sort of see in the simple presence of GSA making a difference at the population level in schools, is that um, GSAs are doing something <laughs> that, and what I think, is that they become the f signal for a different kind of accept, for like an acceptance, a, a tolerance, or acceptability of like a discourse and presence of an acknowledgement of LGB people lives issues. Um, one of the big, you know, one of the f early findings in this literature that's so simple and would be, in, uh, ed researchers should be doing this, is like counting the numbers of posters and books in the library and stuff that you visually see on the wall as a major correlate of like safe school climate for LGBT students. So just like visibility, <laughs> you know, like making as part of the text of the school climate, school environment, uh, an, an absence of silence <laughs> with respect to sexual orientation, gender identity. I mean, I think that's a baseline. Um, and so I do think that a community, you know, that it's a taller order for a community-based organization to do, like young people are required to be in schools, at least so far in the American experience, that's been the case, right, in, in the U U.S. experience. We've like had public education for all children. And so in the context of that, the it, schools have been an extraordinary place, right, where we've been able to try interventions that would reach all kids. Um, let's hope that we continue to have schools that are for all students, for, for everyone, right? Um, and ways that can we... I know, I want to push back a little bit because yeah. the idea of having a safe haven away from school where you can be free to express yourself in a way where you maintain the Yeah, and I and, and so I would say I don't you you don't need to push back because I'm with you. I mean, <laughs> I think, but I think it may serve that, and I, and I think that's my point is that it may serve a, a different kind of purpose. And um, the tall order being, for a community-based organization to like have a population impact, I mean maybe it does though. Like we just don't know. And the the fact is now there there are LGBTQ community organizations serving young people, in everywhere. I mean, in, in not everywhere. Not everywhere, not all young people have access, but in many uh, cities and towns across the country now, they exist, and we haven't really um, thought about like what that impact is, you know, and, and so 
but it's you know I you know I we could have like we should have a long conversation about this. You know, my son, I have a gay son, and uh, I have endless stories about my wonderful gay son. But my gay son was absolutely not interested in the GSA or the or the community organization for queer kids. And one of the reasons why is he said they all they do is complain about their parents. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'll take that as a compliment in a weird <laughs> way. He's like, they're all worried because their parents don't want them to be gay. Well, you know, like I've got gay dads. Last thing, last thing I need is to worry about whether I can be gay at home because it's all <laughs> home is gay, gay, gay all the time, gay. So he's like, I don't want to go to that. I'm like, uh, okay, okay, fair enough. So I mean, what is the what is the meaning of that space for the young people that are in it, and for, and you know, who does it serve? Um, yeah. What did you have the shows like even where they do have the GSA? Where the child is in a home where the parents are ultra conservative or whatever, where they don't have the parent support or other community support, and they're also don't want to go to the GSA because they don't want to be stuck right, with the label. Right. Yeah, and one of the early findings about GSAs is that this a stereotype that is not a truth, but that some GSAs were you know straight girls, best friend whose best friends were closeted gay guys. And the GSA was the straight girls who like wanted to create a space that was safe, and the LGB kids never went because it, you know are, don't feel that it's it's too vulnerable making to actually be a participant in it, and that's an indication of it that it's an environmental intervention, right? I mean that it's a it's a it's a culture intervention. Um, anyway, it is it is twelve thirty one. So no. I, I was just about to okay. take it up. All right. and, and thank you all. Um, so thank you all for coming. Special thanks to Cheryl Patterson and Women, Gender, Sexuality for co-sponsoring this talk with us. And um, for those grad students who are staying for the facilitated conversation after, uh, stick around and we'll shape up the circle. Um, and for the rest